The word Renaissance means to be reborn. It is used to describe an enormously important movement of cultural rebirth that began in Italy in the early 1300s, gradually spread northward to other European countries, and finally ended around 1650. The Renaissance was a unique period of history, an era when people actively sought to improve their own cultures by attempting to recapture some of the greatness of the long-forgotten civilizations of ancient Greece and Rome. The Renaissance was a time when new styles of art were developed, when the first Protestant religions were born, when big advances in science expanded basic understanding of our solar system and of human life itself. The Renaissance was also the time when books first became widely available and was when the first great voyages of world exploration began. Because the Renaissance was inspired by the great accomplishments of the civilizations of ancient Greece and Rome, we shall begin this program with a review of what these civilizations were like and how their great achievements came to be forgotten. The highly civilized people who lived in ancient Greece, hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, produced marvelous works of art and architecture, and made lasting contributions to mathematics, science, government, and literature. The Greek Empire developed along the Mediterranean and Black Seas, and at one time reached as far as India. Greeks even ruled Egypt for hundreds of years. Eventually, the Greek Empire was overtaken by the forces of another great empire that was based on the Italian peninsula in the city of Rome. And even though the Romans had conquered Greece, they had such a deep admiration for the Greek culture that they ended up absorbing much of it into their own. By 100 AD, the Roman Empire had expanded across Europe as far north as Scotland and into Asia and Africa as well. The Roman Empire was truly magnificent. Its provinces in Europe were linked to the capital by over 50,000 miles or 83,000 kilometers of paved roads, as well as by a highly organized military system, government, and laws. Wherever the Romans colonized, they introduced their Latin language and their style of art and architecture. They built fine towns and cities with excellent water systems, huge bridges, and so forth. For centuries, the Roman civilization and learning flourished. But over time, corruption, complacency, and decadence weakened the Roman Empire from within. Until finally, in the year 476 AD, the great city of Rome was captured and destroyed by uncivilized barbarian tribes who came from what is now Germany. And this crucial event set off what is sometimes called the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages was when barbarians took control all across Europe. It is the first part of the Middle Ages, or medieval era, so called because it lies in the middle between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance. During the Dark Ages, the magnificent Greco-Roman culture declined and was almost forgotten. And it was not until the start of the Renaissance, 800 years later, that its greatness began to be rediscovered. To glimpse the process of cultural decline that occurred during the Dark Ages, it is interesting to look at what happened when Roman troops pulled out of their northernmost province of Britannia in order to defend their besieged capital far away to the south. With the land of Britain undefended, members of four different barbarian tribes crossed the North Sea and settled there. They built houses in the traditional architectural styles with which they were familiar. Their new villages were constructed using wood and thatch and were quite primitive when compared to the Roman towns of stone, brick, and tile that came before them. That was because the engineering and mathematics skills that had made it possible for the Romans to build elaborate buildings 
complex water and drainage systems, bridges and so forth, did not exist among the uneducated barbarians. And because the barbarians lacked many artistic skills possessed by the Romans as well, the artwork with which they adorned their buildings appeared fairly primitive by comparison. But it is important to note that although learning significantly declined during the Dark Ages, the Christian religion that the barbarians had acquired from Roman Catholic priests took hold across most of Europe. The church ran a few schools, and monks managed to transcribe some of the crumbling books that had survived from the days of ancient Greece and Rome, so that the valuable knowledge they contained would not be lost to mankind forever. Most of these ancient texts would later be translated and reprinted during the Renaissance. The period of history that followed the Dark Ages, around the year 1100, is often called the High Middle Ages. This was a far more inspired era than the Dark Ages. And it is important to realize that it was people who had been influenced by the ideas and events of this period that founded the Renaissance. The High Middle Ages was the time when most of Europe's finest cathedrals and castles were built. It was also a time when the Roman Catholic Church exerted tremendous power over both kings and common folk alike. By the 1200s, more than 10% of the people of Western Europe led religious lives as Catholic monks, nuns, or priests. Back then, nearly everyone believed that, in and of itself, life on Earth was of little value. Life was seen merely as a doorway leading either to the eternal pleasure of heaven or to the eternal misery of hell. Medieval artwork strongly reinforced these beliefs, taught Bible stories, and acted to inspire a deep sense of religious devotion among the mostly illiterate population of Europe. And perhaps it was because so much of the people's attention was focused on their inner spiritual lives at this time that much less energy was devoted to exploring and understanding the physical world that surrounded them. It was here in northern Italy that the first noticeable changes in the medieval way of doing things started to occur right around the dawn of the 14th century. This was the beginning of the Renaissance. During the medieval era, the study of theology the study of God, was the most important branch of learning. But during the Renaissance, people began to pay more attention to earthly life, and the study of humanity, or humanism, became a major focus of scholarly attention. Renaissance humanists relied purely on reason, as opposed to such things as mysticism or astrology, to investigate subjects they believed might help them understand human life and solve the problems that faced mankind. To do this, they actively studied the civilizations of ancient Greece and Rome, because they believed that these civilizations had excelled in humanistic subjects. They dug through ruins for anything that remained of the long-forgotten classical cultures, and marveled at the fabulous works of art and architecture they discovered. And Renaissance humanists traveled to distant monasteries in search of ancient books, for they believed that the wisdom of the past would provide the insights they needed to better understand mankind, the world, and the universe. When the Renaissance began in the early 1300s, the northern part of the Italian peninsula was dotted with a number of city-states a city-state being a small nation ruled by a city. One of the best-known city-states was Venice, which had grown exceedingly wealthy and powerful due to its trade links with Asia. Another important city-state was Florence. It was an important financial center that became a center for Renaissance literature and art as well. During the Renaissance, except for the papal states that were ruled by the Pope, the Italian city-states were ruled by upper-class families. Florence, for example, came to be ruled by the Medici family, owners of the largest banking empire in Europe. The Medicis and other powerful families like them 
used some of their enormous wealth to encourage and support scholars, writers, scientists, and artists. And it was thanks to patrons like them that Renaissance learning and art was able to truly flourish in Italy. During the Renaissance, artists developed many individualistic styles of expression compared to the much more uniform styles developed during the medieval era. And they worked at creating more believable representations than the medieval artists had produced. For example, the people depicted in this medieval stained glass look unrealistic and flat, whereas the figure in this Renaissance stained glass window looks much more lifelike, in part because it possesses the illusion of having a third dimension, depth, due to the use of shading. Renaissance artists also discovered how to use perspective to create the illusion of distance. This was accomplished by progressively decreasing the size of objects, making them appear to recede in space, thus duplicating on a flat surface how humans naturally see things. When perspective first came into use in Renaissance art, it had a captivating, almost magical effect on people. Nearly as magical as the first photographs were when they were introduced 500 years later. One other important difference between Renaissance and medieval art was that Renaissance artists preferred to glorify the human body, as the ancient Greeks and Romans had done. In contrast, during medieval times, the body was generally considered to be an obstacle to spiritual progress and not something worthy of glorification. But renewed interest in accurately portraying the human body in art during the Renaissance had an important effect on science as well, because it helped inspire the first in-depth investigation into the structure of the human body since the days of ancient Rome. During medieval times, cutting open dead human bodies, even for purposes of medical research, was not an acceptable practice. Consequently, medieval understanding of human anatomy was limited and often inaccurate. But a Belgian doctor named Andreas Vesalius, considered to be the father of modern anatomy, boldly struck out against old medieval attitudes. Vesalius collected corpses from gallows and graveyards and used knives and other tools to perform dissections in order to make detailed observations of all aspects of the body's structure. His thorough studies were assembled into a famous illustrated book that inspired many others to follow in his footsteps. And today, the study of human anatomy is the basis of modern medicine. True or false, during the Renaissance, a unified Italian nation did not exist. True or false, the Dark Ages occurred during the last part of the medieval era. True or false, the Renaissance began in northern Spain. True or false, humanism is the study of God. True or false, perspective was rarely used in medieval art. Starting in the 1300s, the old way of seeing and doing things that had characterized life in medieval Europe gradually started to give way to the splendid new vision of the Renaissance. And although the Renaissance was inspired by the ancient cultures of Greece and Rome, it was soon transformed into an age of experimentation, exploration, and innovation. So that by the time the Renaissance ended around 1650, 
a number of important and long-lasting changes had occurred. For example, a much more accurate understanding of the solar system had been achieved thanks to the invention of the telescope. While the invention of the compound microscope in 1590 had allowed people a first glimpse into a hidden world they had never known existed. Improvements in shipbuilding and navigation had resulted in the discovery of three new continents previously unknown to Europeans. A new method for printing books had helped information and ideas rapidly spread. A movement of religious reform had resulted in the creation of the first Protestant faiths and even the old medieval appearance of towns and cities had changed due to the incorporation of new Renaissance styles in architecture. Looking at architecture is an excellent way to improve one's understanding of the past because historical buildings provide valuable information about how people lived and interacted with one another a long time ago. The changes that occurred in architecture between the medieval era and the Renaissance are a good example of this. During medieval times, towering churches and enormous castles were constructed all across Europe and remain as lasting monuments to the medieval way of life. Castles like this one were nothing more than the fortress homes of Europe's most powerful citizens. Most castles were built along similar lines, characterized by high stone walls and towers. And since they were constructed mostly for defense, they were not very comfortable places in which to live. However, during the Renaissance, the nobility shifted away from fortifying their homes. Some even remodeled their old medieval-style castles into places of great beauty, comfort, and elegance. This fine chateau in France contains some good examples of the kinds of changes that Renaissance architects like to make. In this case, the high outer walls of the original castle have been removed, and a huge new house has been built around the one remaining medieval tower. The old medieval moat that once served to protect the castle has been changed into a decorative waterway and the entire building has been surrounded by extremely colorful gardens in which shrubs have been trimmed and plantings arranged to create beautiful geometric patterns. Renaissance architects loved light, and so the buildings they designed usually had lots of large windows that provided illumination for the big, comfortably furnished rooms inside. In addition, just like the palaces of ancient Rome, Fine Renaissance houses were almost always adorned with statues of ancient gods and goddesses that would have been quite out of place in medieval castles. The changes that took place in religious buildings are quite interesting as well. In medieval times, churches were built in the Gothic style seen here, a style that employed heavy ornamentation with elaborate carvings of demons, angels, and saints. But during the Renaissance, church architects tried to give their buildings a brighter, warmer appearance, as they did so beautifully here in the great cathedral in Florence, Italy. Most Renaissance churches were much brighter and warmer feeling on the inside, too, due to the fact that architects shifted away from the use of the overwhelming amounts of stained glass favored during medieval times. Besides the amazing changes that took place in architecture during the Renaissance, a scientific revolution began to take place too. In particular, the revolution in the science of astronomy played an important role during the Renaissance because it radically changed people's understanding of the Earth's place in the universe. Medieval people believed that the Earth never moved and that it was at the center of the universe ringed first by the moon and planets, then the stars, and beyond that, heaven, the dwelling place of God. And this was the official version promoted by the Catholic Church as well. 
During the Middle Ages, the pursuit of scientific knowledge was mostly guided by religious teachings and mysticism, rather than by careful observation. But in the early 1500s, a Polish astronomer named Nicholas Copernicus, considered to be the father of modern astronomy, theorized, but could not actually prove, that the Earth made an orbit around the Sun every year and also spun around on its axis once a day. In 1610, an Italian astronomer named Galileo Galilei used the newly invented telescope to study the motion of the planets, and he was able to clearly demonstrate that Copernicus's theory was correct. However, because Galileo's work also proved that the Earth moved and was not at the center of the universe, it contradicted the official teachings of the Catholic Church. As a result, church officials forced him to publicly declare that his conclusions were false, and they placed him under house arrest for the remainder of his life. Nevertheless, Galileo's theories were soon verified by other Renaissance astronomers and are still the accepted view of our solar system today. The rapid growth of learning that occurred during the Renaissance was made possible by the availability of large numbers of inexpensive books. In medieval times, books like the one seen here were painstakingly copied by hand, a page at a time, usually by Catholic monks living in monasteries. Almost all books were written in Latin, the language of ancient Rome, and of the Roman Catholic Church, a tongue that was no longer spoken. In medieval times, books were quite rare, and not something likely to be found in an ordinary person's home. However, in Germany around 1450, a man named Johannes Gutenberg came up with a clever way of avoiding the tedious process of hand copying. He developed a technique for making movable type, special metal letters used for printing that could be rearranged as desired in order to create words and sentences. Printers stored movable type letters of many different sizes and styles in well-organized type cases like these. Letters from the uppercase and the lowercase were arranged or typeset into sentences for each page. Then, on a printing press like this one, ink was applied and the page was printed out. Gutenberg's speedy new method made the hand copying of books unnecessary. By 1500, movable type was being used by printers all across Europe and they were producing new books by the tens of thousands, mostly in regional languages, instead of just in Latin. Having mass-produced books meant that the latest works of literature and science could reach people rapidly compared to the days of hand copying. And because books became more affordable, a much larger number of people began to learn how to read and write as well. One of the most important Renaissance figures to see his ideas spread by mass-produced books was a German priest and professor named Martin Luther. Luther was the leader of the Reformation, a religious movement that led to the birth of Protestantism. In the early 1500s, Luther had become increasingly concerned about what he believed were corrupt practices in the Catholic Church, practices that he thought went against biblical teaching. In 1517, he posted his thoughts, called the 95 Theses, to the door of a church here in the town of Wittenberg, Germany, for all to read. In this document, Luther particularly questioned the church's practice of selling indulgences. These were special pardons for the church's punishments for committing sins that sometimes were granted for a cash payment. Luther also made known his belief that popes and church councils could, and often did, make mistakes in religious matters. Luther asked for reform, but he was excommunicated or banned from the Catholic Church instead. In this great cathedral in the city of Worms, Germany, Luther was brought before a group of clergymen and nobles. He was ordered to withdraw his proposals for reform. Luther refused to do so, and ended up going his own way. Many people believed that Luther had been correct, 
and they began to follow his teachings. Soon the first Protestant denominations of Christianity, such as Lutheranism and Calvinism, began to form. The Protestants refused to accept the Pope as their leader. They discarded many Catholic beliefs, focused on biblical teachings, and on the development of a more personal relationship with God. The Protestant movement was subjected to brutal repression in certain nations throughout the later part of the Renaissance. It led to immigration and was a major factor in several wars. In 1419, a century before Martin Luther touched off the Protestant Reformation in Germany, an unprecedented program of world exploration had begun far to the south in Portugal. The Portuguese wanted to obtain African gold, salt, and ivory, and find a sea route to Asia so they could control the rich trade in spices, silks, jewels, and other goods that the Asian kingdoms produced. To accomplish these goals, Prince Henry of Portugal established a school for navigation in his kingdom, near the southwestern tip of the European continent. Here he gathered together the finest geographers, astronomers, mathematicians, map makers, and sailors that he could find. They collected information about the tides, ocean currents, the winds, and the stars. And they used a new kind of small, sturdy ship to explore the west coast of Africa, hoping to find a sea route to India. Before he died in 1460, Prince Henry the Navigator had sent out over 50 expeditions to explore the world. But it wasn't until 1498 that a Portuguese explorer named Vasco da Gama finally reached India. By then, another explorer named Christopher Columbus, who sailed under the flag of Spain, was busy preparing to make a third voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. On his first voyage west in 1492, Columbus thought he had landed in India. Instead, he had actually discovered an entire new world, the continents of North and South America, that were unknown to Europeans at that time. And it was through their quest for trade and wealth that European explorers like Columbus established colonies in many far-flung lands and ended up spreading Renaissance culture, religious ideas, and inventions around the world. True or false, Copernicus and Galileo believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe. True or false, Martin Luther wanted to reform Europe's Protestant churches. True or false, movable type printing was invented in Germany. True or false, stained glass windows were more popular in the churches of the Middle Ages than those of the Renaissance. True or false, Spain carried out the first major explorations of the world. <laughs>